Hi, this is Chris with Nightfall Audiobooks. This is the final book in the Fear Street Sagas trilogy, Book 3, The Burning. This is how Fear Street came to be. This is the story behind the Fear Mansion burning down. And when anyone in Shadyside looks at the Fear Mansion and says, Simon and Angelica Fear tortured people and buried them all over the place, the whole cemetery around Fear Street, all the legends that go along with it, most of them true, all of that takes place here. So this is the basis for Fear Street and for Shadyside. We begin this story in New Orleans, so at some point we move somewhere else because I know Shadyside is somewhere on the United States East Coast. This is the first book of 2024. Welcome to 2024. <laughs> Never thought I would be saying that. There are parts of this book that don't translate too well to audio. The primary thing is the spelling of the last name. When the Fear Street Sagas trilogy began, the last name was pronounced Fear, but spelled F-I-E-R. And at the end of the second book, after Simon meets with the old witch Aggie, he changes the spelling of the last name from F-I-E-R, Fear, to F-E-A-R, also pronounced Fear, as in Fear Street. To make it easier for you to understand, I will be spelling the last names F-I-E-R and F-E-A-R, so you understand the distinction that's on the page. Like, I don't know how else to do it in audio, that the spelling of the last name is changing. This is going to be a lot of fun to read. It's a, it's a very, very short book, so this story will go very fast. So let's get started. What should I do next? I don't know. Please let me know. Write me an email, nightfallaudiobooks at gmail.com. I'm also on YouTube at Nightfall Audiobooks. Feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. Tell your friends, tell your mom, tell whoever you think would like to listen to me, tell them tales from R.L. Stein. So thank you very much for listening, and I will see you next time. Welcome to a Nightfall Audiobooks production of the Fear Street Sagas, Book 3, The Burning, by R. L. Stein. Village of Shadyside, 1900 The candle flickered low, candle wax puddled on a narrow wooden tabletop. Nora Good set down her pen and stretched, her shoulders ached, she rubbed her tired eyes. Shadows cast by the single candle danced around the small room. Nora raised her eyes to the small window. Pale gray light seeped in between the bars. The first light of morning, Nora thought. She felt a stab of panic in her chest. The first light of morning, and I still have so much to write. She flexed her aching fingers, then picked up the pen. I must finish my story before they come for me, she murmured. The story of the two families. The fears and the goods. The story of the evil curse that followed them through time. So much to tell. She had been writing all night, but she knew she had to continue. Nora swept her dark hair back over her shoulders, then gave a start. What was that darting shadow against the wall? Nora turned to see a scrawny rat scamper across the bare floorboards toward her feet. Ignore it, she told herself. Do not be distracted, Nora. This story is too important. It must be told. It must be written. If I do not finish the story of the fears, no one will know how to stop the evil. Then the horrors will continue forever. Nora hunched over the table and started to write again. I must now tell the story of Simon Fear, she decided. To try to avoid the family curse, Simon changed his name from Fear, F-I-E-R, to Fear, F-E-A-R. As a young man of twenty-one, he moved to New Orleans to seek his fortune. Nora shook her head bitterly. Did Simon really believe he could leave two hundred years of evil behind him? Ignoring the scratching of the rat, ignoring the sputtering of the dying candle, Nora dipped her pen in the inkwell and continued to write. Part 1. New Orleans, Louisiana, 1845 Chapter 1 Simon Fear stopped in front of the white picket fence that stretched the length of the sprawling white mansion. Through the enormous front window, he could see the party-goers in fancy dress. It was brighter than day inside the ballroom. The light from the window swept over the front lawn, 
Horse-drawn carriages waited in line by the entrance to let off their passengers. A row of servants in uniform stood ready to assist them. Simon hesitated. He pulled at the cuffs of his jacket. The sleeves were too short. His shirt cuffs were frayed. He had no ruffles on his shirt front. These are the wealthiest society people in New Orleans, he told himself, watching a woman in a full three-tiered pink ball gown enter the white-columned mansion. Do I really have the nerve to enter this party without an invitation? The answer, of course, was yes. Before dressing for the party, Simon had made a mental list of his assets. I am good-looking. I can be very charming and witty if I desire to be. I am as smart as anyone in New Orleans. I am determined to do anything it takes to be a success. Taking a deep breath, Simon straightened his black cape with the purple satin lining and strode up to the gate, his eyes on the entrance. I am sure that Mr. Henry Pierce and his charming daughter Angelica would have invited me to their debutante ball if they had known me, Simon told himself. Well, tonight I will give them a chance to get to know me, and I will take this opportunity to introduce myself to as many wealthy young ladies as I can. After tonight, I will not have to sneak into parties. The invitations will pour in. Simon stopped at the gate. From inside the open double doors, he could hear laughter, the clink of glasses, and the soft music of a string quartet. These sounds were being repeated all over the town. It was Mardi Gras, and all of New Orleans was celebrating with mass balls, debutante parties, and wild, noisy street parades. The fancy dress ball Henry Pierce was throwing for his daughter Angelica was the most exclusive party of them all, which was why Simon had selected it. But now, gazing at the line of serpents that blocked his way to the entrance, Simon began to lose confidence. Can I really get past them? he wondered, pulling nervously at his jacket cuffs. Have I come this far only to be turned away? No. I cannot deprive the beautiful and wealthy young women of my company. Without any further hesitation, Simon swept his cape behind him and moved through the gate and up the wide stairs. I beg your pardon, sir. A white-haired servant wearing a tailcoat over old-fashioned knee breeches and a red satin waistcoat stepped forward, his hand outstretched. May I see your invitation? My invitation? Simon smiled at the servant, his dark eyes flashing in the bright gaslight. Why, yes, of course, he said, stalling for time. Reaching into his coat pocket, Simon dipped his head and deliberately caused his black top hat to fall off. The hat bounced onto the wide porch. Pretending to reach for it, Simon kicked it toward the door. Allow me to get that for you, sir, the servant said, moving quickly toward the hat. But Simon was quicker. He scooped up the hat by its brim, then threw his arm around the shoulders of a smartly dressed gentleman just entering the house. Why, George, old fellow, how good to see you again, Simon declared loudly, keeping his arm around the man's shoulders and entering the house with him. Do I know you? the startled man cried. Sorry, my mistake, Simon replied with a curt bow. The servant stepped into the doorway to search for Simon, but he had already lost himself in the crowd. He was breathing hard, excited by his daring entrance. His smile remained confident as he handed his cape and hat to a servant and moved into the ballroom. Crystal chandeliers hung low from the ceiling, sending a blaze of yellow gaslight over the crowded room. The vast floor was an intricate pattern of dark and light inlaid wood. The walls were covered in brocade. Simon studied the young women, such beautiful young women, with sausage curls framing the sides of their glowing faces. Their long hooped ball gowns swept across the shiny floor. Their voices chimed brightly. Their laughter tinkled like the clink of champagne glasses. The men strutted about in their dark tailcoats and taper-legged trousers. Simon scoffed at their flowing white cravats and ruffled white shirts, scoffed and envied them at the same time. It takes more than a ruffled shirt to make a gentleman, he reminded himself. I am as much a gentleman as any of these peacocks, and some day I will have a wardrobe full of ruffled shirts, shirts to put all of these dandies to shame. In the far corner, a string quartet played Hayden. Simon started to make his way toward the center of the room, but a servant lowered a silver tray in front of him. Champagne, sir? It arrived from France only this morning. No, thank you. Simon stepped past the servant, his eyes on two young women in silk ball gowns against the wall. I have more serious business here than drinking champagne, he told himself. Turning on his most charming smile, he slicked back his dark hair, tugged at his coat cuffs, and made his way to introduce himself to the two young women. 
Good evening, he said with a polite nod of his head. The two young women, pale and blonde with sparkling blue eyes, turned briefly to stare at him. Then, without replying, they returned to their conversation. Wonderful party, Simon offered, standing his ground, continuing to smile. They ignored him. Allow me to introduce myself, he said, refusing to give up. They walked away without another glance at him. Such snobs, Simon sneered. There are so few wealthy people in this town that they all know one another. They stick together and do not allow any newcomers in, especially newcomers with a northern accent. The Hayden piece ended. After a brief pause, the quartet began to play a reel. The room erupted excitedly as the young men and women quickly formed two long lines across the floor and began to dance. Simon stepped into the line. He didn't know how to do this reel, but he was confident he could pick it up. Confidence. That was the key, Simon knew. That was the key to being accepted by these wealthy New Orleans snobs. As he picked up the rhythm of the dance, Simon attempted to catch the attention of the dark-haired girl across from him. She glanced at him briefly, then deliberately avoided him, keeping her eyes to the floor until the dance had ended. I will triumph here eventually, Simon reminded himself. Young women will be begging me for a dance. He made his way across the crowded, noisy room toward the central hall and then stopped short in the doorway. A wide stairway, its banister festooned with yellow and white daisies, stretched up to his right, and standing on the bottom step, facing him as she leaned over the flowers, was the most beautiful girl Simon had ever seen. She had black hair, lustrous in the gaslight from the chandelier above her head. Curls tumbled beside her face with clusters of flowers holding them in place. Simon could see her flashing green eyes, cat-like eyes above a perfect slender nose, dark full lips, high, aristocratic cheekbones, and the creamy white skin of her shoulders revealed above the lace-edged top of her blue ball gown. A blue ball gown. Most of the other young women had selected pink and white and yellow. This one stood out boldly in satiny blue. Simon moved closer, staring intently at this striking vision. He suddenly realized that his mouth was dry, his knees weak. Is this what the poets call love at first sight? He wondered. It was a feeling Simon had never expected. The young woman was still leaning against the banister, talking to another young woman, tall and frail looking in a gown of pink satin. Look up, look up, please look toward me, Simon urged silently. But the two kept chattering, seemingly unaware of Simon's existence. I must speak to her, Simon decided. What is her name? He was so smitten, so stunned by the feeling sweeping over him, that Simon didn't realize he'd spoken the question aloud. That is Henry Pierce's daughter, Angelica, an elderly man with a white mustache replied, eyeing Simon suspiciously. Are you unfamiliar with our host and his family? Angelica Pierce, Simon muttered, ignoring the man's question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Angelica Pierce, you do not know me, Simon thought, dizzy with excitement, a kind of excitement he had never felt before. But you shall. You and I are meant for each other. I shall introduce myself now, Simon decided, his heart pounding. He straightened his tailcoat and cleared his throat. Continuing to stare intently at Angelica Pierce, he took two steps toward the staircase. But he was stopped by firm hands on his shoulders. Two grim-faced young servants had blocked Simon's path. I am sorry, sir, one of them said coldly, a sneer contradicting his polite words. But if you haven't an invitation, we must ask you to leave. Chapter 2 President Polk, he isn't here tonight, is he? You are teasing me, are you not, Angelica? Liza Dupree gaped open-mouthed at her cousin. Angelica laughed. You are so gullible, cousin Liza. What if I told you that the King of France was here? Would you believe that, too? Liza's cheeks reddened. You are always teasing me, Angelica. You have such a cruel sense of humor. I do, don't I? Angelica exclaimed, toying with a shiny black curl. You should have known President Polk wasn't here, Angelica told her cousin. This party is much too exclusive. He would never get through the door. Both girls laughed. Did you see the gown Amanda Barton is wearing? Angelica asked cattily. No. Is it charming and wonderful? Liza asked. About as charming and wonderful as our window draperies, Angelica said with a sneer. In fact, I believe it is made of the same fabric. Both girls laughed again. I think this is the most wonderful party, Liza gushed. I just adore... 
She stopped when she saw that she didn't have Angelica's attention. Angelica's gaze had flitted away for a second. Angelica? What did you see? Who is that young man? Angelica asked finally. Who? Which young man? Liza asked. The one in the plain shirt and old-fashioned tailcoat, Angelica replied. Don't allow him to see you looking. He is staring hard this way with big dark eyes. Liza searched until she found him. What an expression, she declared, raising a hand to stifle her laughter. Those brown eyes. He looks so sad and forlorn, like one of your father's hunting hounds. Liza expected Angelica to laugh, but she didn't. Why is he staring at me like that? Angelica demanded, stealing quick glances at him. Do I know him? I think I have seen his clothes on a scarecrow in one of my father's cotton fields. Liza choked. But I have never seen him. He, he is frightening me, Angelica stammered. Her face suddenly appeared pale. The color faded from her eyes. Don't let him see us stare at him. He will surely come over, Liza warned. Shall we go upstairs for a rest? She knew that Angelica was fragile, not as robust as she appeared. No, I... Look, Angelica cried. Both girls peeked as two solemn-faced servants stepped up to the young man. There was a brief argument. Then each servant grabbed an arm and forcefully pulled the young man toward the door. Oh my, oh my, Angelica cried, raising her hands to her pale cheeks. Liza placed a hand on her cousin's shoulder. It's all right. A few girls cried out in alarm. Angelica heard the rush of murmured questions throughout the room. The string quartet stopped playing. He is leaving. It is all right, Liza assured her cousin. Angelica watched as a young man moved toward the door, taking long strides, not turning back. As soon as he had disappeared, the music started up again. Just an intruder, Liza said. I wonder how we got past the servants. Angelica's expression was thoughtful. Her emerald eyes began to sparkle again. That young man was rather interesting, she told her cousin. There was something about him, her voice trailed off. Angelica Pierce, I am ashamed of you, Liza protested. How can you be so selfish? Selfish? Angelica asked, raising her long skirt as she stepped down to the carpet. You already have not one but two handsome young men eager for your attentions. James Daumier and Hamilton Scott are two of the best-looking, wealthiest young men in all of New Orleans, and they would both die if they knew you found that shabby intruder interesting. Angelica sighed. Speak of the devil, she said, rolling her eyes. Here comes James. It must be his dance. Well, go, Liza urged giving her cousin a gentle shove. And smile! This is your party, remember? Angelica forced a smile and raised her eyes to James. James grinned at her, showing off about eight hundred teeth. Does he have to grin at me like that? Angelica wondered unhappily. I am always afraid he is going to bite me. Most girls would probably consider James Domier good-looking, Angelica realized. He was tall and broad-shouldered and had intense silver-gray eyes beneath white blonde hair. If only he wouldn't grin like a dog that's just tucked away a juicy bone, Angelica thought. I have been looking all over for you. Were you and your cousin Liza gossiping about me? James teased. We might have been, Angelica replied coyly. She took his arm and allowed him to lead her to the dance floor. He danced stiffly, standing three feet in front of her, his grin frozen on his face, his silver gray eyes staring into hers. Are the musicians going to play that new dance? He whispered, leaning closer. The waltz? Angelica gasped and narrowed her eyes coyly at James. James Daumier, she cried. You know my father would never allow evil waltz music to be played in this house. What a scandalous thought! James frowned in mock disappointment. I have heard that it is quite an enjoyable dance. Angelica started to reply, but James turned away as another young man tapped his shoulder. Angelica immediately recognized her other young suitor, Hamilton Scott. I believe this is my dance, Hamilton told James with a polite nod. James made an exaggeratedly formal bow, flashing Angelica one last grin, backed away. Hamilton had curly red hair and a face full of freckles. Angelica thought he looked about twelve, but he was nineteen, a serious young man with strong political feelings. While James liked to talk to Angelica about fashion and friends and the sleek thoroughbred racehorses his father raised, Hamilton lectured her on the morality of slavery and the trade policies of the French. I wish you could dance every dance with me, Hamilton told her. I do not think my feet would survive it, Angelica teased. She spent the rest of the evening dancing with James and Hamilton. She knew she should be having the time of her life, 
After all, it was Mardi Gras, and after this party there would be another party, and then another. But she found her mind wandering. Something was troubling her. When the party had ended and the last carriage clattered off into the night, Angelica walked past the servants busily cleaning up the ballroom and stepped through the French doors into the garden. It was a cool night, the air soft and sweet-smelling. Paper lanterns with oil lamps inside cast pale yellow light at her feet. A heavy dew made the grass glisten. Angelica bent and pulled off her satin party slippers. Holding them in one hand, she let her stockinged feet sink into the cool wet grass. I should be thinking of James or Hamilton, she scolded herself. Then why does that intense-looking stranger keep filling my thoughts? I am eighteen, Angelica thought. Father wishes me to marry soon. He is impatient for me to decide between James and Hamilton. He will make me marry one of them. Do I love James? Do I love Hamilton? I like them both, she told herself. I like them both for different reasons. James for his good looks, his charm, his mischievous sense of humor. Hamilton for his intelligence, his seriousness, his caring. But do I love them? Do I want to marry either of them? Deep in thought, gazing into the soft lantern light, listening to the rustle of the breeze through the magnolia blossoms, Angelica took a few steps into the garden. She was too stunned to cry out when strong hands grabbed her from behind. Chapter 3 Angelica gasped and spun out of her attacker's grasp. Do not cry out, he whispered. You, Angelica stammered, her heart pounding. Who are you? What are you doing here? Do not be afraid. I will not harm you, Simon Fear whispered. But how did you get into my garden? Angelica demanded, her face turning to anger. Who are you? My name is Simon Fear, he told her, his dark eyes locked on hers. Angelica bent to pick up her shoes, which in her alarm she had allowed to fall. But she kept her eyes trained warily on Simon. You entered my party uninvited, she said, standing up. Now you attack me in my garden. Are you a thief? Are you mad? What do you want? I want you to marry me, Simon replied without hesitation. He pulled off his top hat and held it in front of him with both hands. His dark hair fluttered in the breeze. Angelica started to reply, but only a startled laugh escaped her throat. The answer is that you are mad, she declared. Will you turn and leave the way you came, or do I have to call the servants to usher you out once again? I saw you at your ball, Simon said, ignoring her questions, determined to tell her what was in his heart. I saw you standing on the staircase, and I knew that I was in love with you. From one glance, Angelica scoffed, and how much champagne had you drunk, Mr. Fear? Angelica, I knew at that moment, Simon continued, that you would be my wife. Angelica laughed again, but her laughter was tinged with fear. Have you escaped from an asylum? she demanded. Are you dangerous? Can you hear a word I say? You will be my wife, Angelica, Simon insisted, his dark eyes glowing in the lantern light. I am going to call for help now, Angelica told him, shivering. The hem of her long ball gown was wet. The wet grass had chilled her feet, and the cold ran up her body. Please. I will leave, Simon offered, still holding the top hat in front of him. I did not mean to alarm you, but I had to come back. I had to see you, to talk to you. You have said more than enough, Angelica told him dryly. Simon replaced his hat and began running toward the back fence, the fence he had climbed to enter the garden. Halfway there he turned back to her. You will marry me, Angelica Pierce. Mark my words. As he climbed the fence and vanished from the garden, her scornful laughter rang in his ears. Simon wandered dizzily through town. The Mardi Gras parade had ended, sending hundreds of costume revelers into the streets lively dance music, the strump of banjos, and the happy cries of fiddles and harmonicas poured from every doorway. Torches floated by, casting a wash of eerie yellow light over the shouting, laughing faces. A group of masked party-goers rolled a barrel-sized keg of beer along the side of the street. Several bare-chested men, weaving arm in arm ahead of Simon, sang a sad song at the top of their lungs. Simon didn't see any of it as he made his way aimlessly through the whooping, laughing crowds of the French Quarter. All he could see was Angelica Pierce, dazed and nearly delirious with happiness. He wandered until he left the noisy crowds behind. All torchlight disappeared. This old section of town was dark, lit only by the sliver of moon overhead. Where am I? Simon asked himself, noticing for the first time the low wooden buildings, all dark and silent. 
I seemed to have wandered down by the docks. The darkness brought darker thoughts to his mind. Angelica, he had seen, already had suitors, two suitors to be exact. After he had been removed from the party, Simon had doubled back and found a hiding place in front of the house. From his vantage point, he had spied into the ballroom window. Staring into the brightness, he had watched Angelica dance. He had seen the two young men who were her partners. Simon didn't know their names, but he would make it his business to find out. Two worthy young gentlemen, Simon thought bitterly, but I am more worthy. I may not have their money or breeding, but I shall have Angelica. His heart still pounded with the excitement of meeting Angelica. The dark streets appeared to tilt up to meet him. The low buildings grew darker. Behind the buildings he could hear the rush of water. The docks must be on the next block, he realized. I have wandered into an unsafe neighborhood. Just as he had this thought, he felt a heavy arm take hold of him. He felt a sharp pain as something sharp was pressed against his throat. Chapter 4 Simon tried to cry out, but the pressure against his throat made him gag. It took him a few seconds to realize it was a blade of a knife pressed against his neck. I'll be taking your purse, a raspy voice whispered close to his ear. So close, Simon could smell the whiskey on his attacker's breath. Or I'll be cutting your throat. Simon croaked out a helpless protest. A fine gentleman like you doesn't want his throat cut, the man rasped. Does he? Then the attacker eased back the knife blade just enough to allow Simon to speak. Uh, I'll pay you, Simon managed to choke out. I cannot die on this lonely dark street, Simon thought, his legs trembling, his heart thudding loudly. I can't die now. I have just met Angelica. I have but little money, Simon said in a trembling voice, but I will give it all to you. Yes, you will, and quickly, the thief ordered. He loosened his hard grip on Simon, then gave him a hard shove in the back. Startled, Simon cried out and stumbled to his knees on the hard cobblestones. He glanced up to see his attacker, a dark-haired young man with a red bandana tied across his forehead. He was swaying drunkenly, squinting hard at Simon. What are you looking at? He rasped angrily at Simon. Your purse, or I'll cut you now. He waved the knife. Uh, I'm getting it, Simon stammered. As he pushed his cape out of the way, a stud fell out of his shirt front and Simon's silver pendant dropped into view. Simon never removed the pendant since his sister Elizabeth had given it to him, back home in Wickham two years before. With its three silver claws and mysterious blue jewels, the disc-shaped pendant had been in the Fear family for generations. A strange old fortune teller named Aggie had told him all about the pendant and its powers. But Simon had resisted using it. He had no use for evil magic. Climbing to his feet, Simon quickly grabbed the chain and started to tuck the pendant back into his dress shirt. But the thief had spotted it. He raised his knife menacingly, the long blade gleaming in the moonlight. Do not try to hide the silver coin, mate, the man growled. He stretched out his free hand. I will take it, too. It is not a coin, Simon protested. It is a family memento, worthless to anyone except me. Give it up, the thief shouted impatiently. Simon reluctantly stepped forward. Holding the silver disc tightly in one hand, he struggled to remove the slender chain from around his neck. The silver disc felt warm in his hand and vibrated as he gripped it. A gust of wind blew down the street, fluttering Simon's cape. He reached to hand the pendant to the thief, but instead of dropping it, Simon suddenly shoved the disc hard into the man's face. The four dark jewels dug into his cheek. The thief cried out, more startled than hurt. Hey, you die for that, he cried, brandishing the knife. Still gripping the silver pendant, Simon jumped back. Dark blood trickled down the man's cheek from small puncture holes. With an angry snarl, he came at Simon. Simon dodged the knife. The thief swayed, squinting hard, trying to keep his balance, cursing under his breath. He leapt forward again, forcing Simon back against the building wall. A pleased grin slowly formed on the man's face as he realized he had Simon trapped. He stepped forward, watching Simon's helpless attempts to move away from the wall. And then he stopped. A howl of pain escaped his lips. He let the knife drop to the ground and grabbed the sides of his face with both hands. Help me! My face! It's on fire, he screamed. Even in the pale moonlight, Simon could see the man's face darken, as if badly sunburned. Help me, the man shrieked. Oh, please. His back pressed against the wall. Simon stared in helpless horror, 
as the man's face darkened more, then blistered. The blisters popped open and began to seep. The man's eyes rolled around, his hands flailed. His shrieks faded to whimpers as the blistered skin burned away. Chunks of skin melted off, revealing gray bone underneath. Gasping in agony, the man continued to whimper until no skin remained. A gray skull, locked in a hideous grin of horror, stared pitifully at Simon, and then the body crumpled to the ground. His chest heaving, the blood throbbing at his temples. Simon swallowed hard, forcing back his horror at the gruesome sight. Then he carefully slipped the chain around his neck and tucked the ancient pendant under his dress shirt. I have used the power of the ancient amulet, he realized. The Fear family has long had powers, powers it has used for evil, powers it has used for so many generations, in its battle against the goods. Dominato per malum. Those were the Latin words engraved on the back of the silver disc. Power through evil. Simon had long resisted the evil power of the Fear family. He had vowed never to use the ancient power of the pendant. The good family had been defeated. The centuries-old feud between the goods and the fears was over. Aggie, the fortune teller, had told Simon his family would end in fire. The family name had been Fear then, F-I-E-R. Rearrange the letters in Fear, F-I-E-R, and you've got fire, the old woman had exclaimed. Simon was determined that this prediction would never come true. So he had changed his name from Fear, F-I-E-R, to Fear, F-E-A-R. He wore the ancient evil pendant, but never used it, until this dark Mardi Gras night. Wild thoughts raced through Simon's mind as he stared down at the dead figure crumpled at his feet. I have the powers of the fears, he realized. I have the power to get what I want. And what do I want most in the world? I want Angelica Pierce. Beautiful Angelica. Two obstacles stand in my path, Simon thought excitedly. Two obstacles. The two young men I saw dancing with her. It shall be easy to get them out of my way, he decided, feeling the warmth of the pendant against his chest. The two young men have wealth and breeding, but I am a fear, and what good are wealth and breeding if you are dead? Having decided on his course of action, Simon swept his cape around himself. Then, stepping over the thief's body, he started toward home humming happily to himself.